So I don't know about you, um, but the older I get, the longer I adult, the further I travel down this journey of parenting, parenting four girls, for those of you who don't know me, um, the more I begin to appreciate and understand the parenting strategies that were employed against me when I was a child. <laughs> like, I, like when I was a kid, I didn't get it. But, but now I do. It, it makes all the sense in the world. All right. Now, I was uh, raised in what felt like a village. There were about 12 people in my home uh, growing up. And so one of the things we couldn't do when I was a child is we couldn't just roam around in the kitchen <laughs> as kids. Like we could, now, I know that we've completely normalized this idea of letting kids walk in the kitchen, open the refrigerator door, and take out whatever they want and enjoy it whenever they want. But that's not my testimony. <laughs> we would never do that. Matter of fact, I did that one time, and I still haven't recovered. Okay, <laughs> I still, I st still got some trauma from that. Uh, so another thing my parents did is uh, when we would sit down and eat dinner, they would put all of our plates on the table, but they wouldn't put the cups on the table. So whatever we were drinking that night, whether it was milk or water or juice, they would put the cups on the counter. And so we had to eat all of our food first, and then we could get up, put our plates away, and then we could enjoy our drink. I didn't get that when I was a kid. I was like, why are they doing that to us? But then I had kids. <laughs> and I watched my kids get, you know, full off of all the liquid. They don't eat their food. They waste the food. And they come to me later like, daddy, daddy, I'm hungry. And that, it just makes all the sense in the world to me. <laughs> Here's another one. Uh, when I would go out with my mom, when we, were, we would go out, we would either be at a store or we'd be on a long car ride. Um, I was always wanting something to drink. All right. So we'd be out and I, I would get thirsty and I would say, mom, I'm thirsty. And my mom always had uh, this canned response. Now, before I tell you what the response is, I need to give you a little bit of insight into black culture. Because if you don't understand this, you won't get my mom's response. You won't understand what she was communicating to me. So let me just talk to you about black culture for a little bit. All right. So, uh, you know, we, you know, have this common experience of struggle. And so for us, we tend to do all we can not to put ourselves in situations where we can't predict all the possible outcomes. Right. So the higher the chance of danger, the lower the chance typically that you see a black person in that situation. <laughs> all right, are you guys doing okay with this? Are you doing okay? I'm black. We'll be all right. We'll make it. We'll make it. We'll make it. All right. Let me give you some examples. I, I don't know a single black skydiver or bungee jumper. <laughs> no. I'm sure they exist. I'm sure they're out there. All right. And, and you know what? Don't come up to me after service showing me a picture of the one you know. Okay. All right. I get it. They're probably out there. I just don't know one. I don't know one. All right. Here, here's another one. Here's another one. I don't know a single black person that lives in the state of Alaska. Again, I'm sure they exist. I'm sure there's some fine black folks that live in Alaska. If you're from Alaska and you're watching, God bless you. Black people. But I personally don't know any Escobros. All right? I just don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know any. I don't know any. All right. So, and not only, not only do we tend to not put ourselves in situations that, that we can't predict outcomes, but we're also really hard on each other when it comes to bizarre things that happen to us unnecessarily. All right. Like, do you guys remember last year there was a, there was a trail runner who was running in the mountains of Utah and he encountered a mountain lion and got chased away. Do you guys remember that? Right? Uh, this thing went viral. So this guy, he's running and I guess he encountered this mountain lion and its cubs or whatever you call mountain lion's babies. All right. So uh, he encountered the, the mountain lion and his babies and the mountain lion starts to chase him away and he gets his camera out and he's like backpedaling the whole way. This thing goes completely viral, right? And you know, he didn't get hurt. So, you know, God's good there. Right, but can you imagine if this man was attacked and killed by this mountain lion? It, do you know what we would have said? We would have said, man, that's a tragedy. What, what a shock. What a catastrophe. That's what we would have said. But 
Can you imagine if it was a black man that got attacked and killed by this mountain lion? Do you know what they would have said about him at the cookout? <laughs> Do you know what they would have said about him at the barbershop? <laughs> they would have got the paper and it would have said, black man attacked and killed by a mountain lion in the mountains of Utah. What was he doing in the mountains of Utah? <laughs> Like, 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 before we can even properly grieve, we got questions that need to be answered, right? <laughs> like, like, life is hard, struggling is real, so why would you put yourself in unnecessary situations where you can suffer? Right. That's what it's like. See, how you, even the baby's laughing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, that's what was on my mom's heart when she would give me my response. All right. So whenever we were out and I would want something to drink, I would say to mom, Mom, I'm thirsty. And this is what my mom would say to me. She would say, drink your spit. <laughs> Every, let's just say that together. Everyone look at someone and say, drink your spit. <laughs> now, l- listen, listen. My mom's here too, so she's mad. <laughs> you guys are going to have to barricade me on the way out because the trauma is still real. Okay, listen, listen. That sounds pretty harsh, yeah? All right. You know, I've come to, you know, I come to see it as productively harsh, you know? And, and what's actually funny is to see how this has played to my kids because my mom has said the same thing to my kids. And uh, a couple of years ago, my mom was out with my youngest daughter, Ella. And I mean, Ella was barely even talking. She was like four years old, maybe. And they're out on a drive. And my mom is, she's driving. And she says to Ella, my youngest, she says, I'm thirsty, to which Ella from the back seat in her car seat speaks up and she says, drink your spit. (laughs) So listen, this thing is passed down from generation to generation. It's multi-generational, I'm telling you. It just is. It is. So over the years, I've, I've, I've come to understand and appreciate my mom's stance here. Uh, you know, because what she's saying to me when she said that is she wasn't communicating to me, I don't care. That wasn't it. But what she was saying to me was this. She was saying, son, there's nothing I can do about this right now. You're not the only one that's thirsty. And I know you're uncomfortable, but I need you to hang on. That's what she was communicating to me. Amen? And so as we uh, think about thirst and the need for water, uh, we are uh, in the final message of a series that we've been calling Building the Well Within. And our resolve has been to press in on learning to live from living water, all right? Uh, We've been preparing ourselves for Easter by looking at specific encounters uh, with Jesus in the book of John. And as we've traveled through, uh, we have seen how the living water that he provides is not only what we need, but it's what we want, and it's the only thing that fully satisfies and sustains us, amen? And so our key verse in this series comes from John chapter 7 at a time uh, where they are beginning to celebrate the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths was near. Uh, now, the Feast of Booths, uh, known as Sukkot, or, or the Feast of Tabernacle, uh, was a, a, a pilgrimage feast where Israelites were required to travel to the temple. All right? So people began to ask Jesus, hey, are you going to this? Are you going to this? And Jesus uh, knew, he was keenly aware of the fact that people were after his life. He knew that the closer he got to the temple, the more his life was in danger. And so Jesus told them when they were asking him, are you going to go? Are you going to go? He said, my hour has not yet fully come. And as you study the book of John, what you see is that Jesus would often refer to his hour, that he would often reference his death as it was clearly in view to him. And so he sent his disciples ahead, but then Jesus goes to this feast in secret. Now, the Feast of Booths was not just about a pilgrimage, but it was a celebration of God's deliverance and provision when he rescued them from Egypt. And so what they would do is they would all live in, uh, in these temporary uh, shelters or booths during the seven-day feast. All right? And it was at this feast, on the last and greatest day of the feast, that Jesus stands up and he declares our key verse. Jesus stands up in the midst of this feast and he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, believes in me as the scriptures have said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. In the middle of this feast, he stands up and he proclaims this. 
Now, let me show you the symbolism of this because when Jesus said this, uh, there were mixed reviews. There are mixed responses to his statement here. Some called him a demon. Others called him a prophet. Uh, the confusion about where the Christ was gonna come from began to divide the crowd. There were even some who wanted to seize him and kill him in that moment. But the only thing that they could agree upon as a group there at that time was, let us not put our hands on him for now. That was the one thing that the crowd could agree on. And so they're at this feast that commemorates their deliverance from Egypt uh, and their pilgrimage through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. Jesus stands up on the greatest day of this feast and he offers them living water and no one receives him. No one receives him. On a day where they had everything they needed, the greatest and the last day of the feast, living water just wasn't that appealing to them. But this is exactly what this feast is all about. It was the whole point of the feast. That when, when they had, as a people, had nothing, God is all they needed. And they missed it. See, over and over again uh, in the Bible, you see references to the Exodus. Right? Repeatedly, there's this theme of pe the people of God traveling through a wilderness to get to a place of promise. Uh, Psalm 84 says it this way. It says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. Now, the valley of Baca was a place with no water. It was a, a clear representation to the people of God of times of difficulty and dryness in their lives. Uh, Isaiah 43, 19 says, behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So the Exodus is central to the biblical understanding of who God is and of who God's people are. It's not uh, just an interesting detail in history. It both defines Israel's story and it defines the way in which the New Testament presents the story of Jesus. Without understanding the Exodus, how, how God's people became slaved, they experienced difficulty and suffering. They were rescued by the blood, right, the Passover. Then they were rescued by water, right, the Red Sea. And through a wilderness experience, they were brought to a place of safety and inheritance. See, without understanding that, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus loses its depth. Yeah, that's good. Come on, Sean. The, the whole story of the Christian life is effectively an Exodus story in a different key. So when we talked about building the well within, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show you that this world is a wilderness. And throughout this life, the truth is that in this life, even as a Christian, we will have more wilderness experiences than feasts. And God is creating a reservoir in his people. Uh, God desires uh, that his people will dig deep wells within so that we can carry his living water. So you see, uh, the world is a wilderness, yeah? But God has opened up a fountain in the wilderness for his people. And the only way that this fountain is available is because God entered into the wilderness and poured himself out for us. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Let, let me show you what this looks like using the Exodus story, because like, you guys went blank, like <laughs> blank on me. All right. All right, we're going to look at the Exodus story because you're going to be shocked by how much their story is really ours. All right, so early in the book of Exodus, we see that the people of God have become slaves and their slavery has persist, persisted for over 400 years. God raises up Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4 and he sends them to Pharaoh in chapter 5. And he says to Pharaoh, he says this, he says, let my people go so they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh says no, and every time he says no, God brought a plague on Egypt. And so from Exodus chapter 5 through Exodus chapter 12, all right, Moses says, let us go 10 times. 10 times Pharaoh says no, and 10 times they were hit with devastating plagues. In Exodus 14, after they've been delivered from Egypt, the people grumble against Moses because they are being chased by Pharaoh. And this is what they say. They say, it would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. What does God do? God then parts the Red Sea. 
They walked through it on dry ground. Pharaoh and his army walked through the Red Sea as well. It crashes down on them and it kills them. They're miraculously saved. Then we get to Exodus chapter 15. The people grumble against Moses again because they can't find water, right? They were bitter, right? And so coincidentally, all they could find was bitter water, right? And this is what they say. They say to Moses, what are we to drink? And what does God do as a miraculous response? God makes the bitter water sweet and they're able to drink the water, right? So the first one, maybe that was a fluke. The second one, maybe that's a trend, huh? <laughs> Then there's Exodus 16. Uh, they begin to grumble in this chapter about food. Uh, while traveling through the wilderness, finding enough food to eat for this large of a group of people was incredibly difficult. And so this is what they say. They say, if, we, if only we would have died in Egypt. At least there we sat around pots of meat and we ate as much as we want. But now you have brought us here into the desert to starve. And see, what they didn't know is that in Egypt, the food was free because they weren't. Is, is my mic on? Like, in Egypt, the food was free because they weren't. And they had all this grumbling. They were complaining. So it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a trend looking like a pattern. Then there's Exodus 17, and we're going to read this together. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to camp here for the rest of our time together. Then all the congregation, starting in verse 1, then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water so that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us out from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And then verse 7. Then he named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Four grumblings. So this is not a fluke. It's not a trend. It's not a pattern. This is a heart posture. So what we're going to see from the story in Exodus 17 is three things. All right, we're going to look at three things together. Because in this story, we see a lawsuit, a trial, and a verdict. All right, we're going to look at a lawsuit, a trial, and a verdict. All right, first, the lawsuit. The children of Israel follow God's lead as they travel through the wilderness of sin and they come to a place where there's no water. Now, this is, this is a great picture of the Christian life uh, because God will always bring you to a place where the things that you trust in first and most, uh, apart from him, fail you, right? He brings us to that place, right? And if you walk with God for a while, it's very common for you to start feeling good about yourself. But at some point, the hard comes, right? At some point, the suffering comes comes. And at the heart of Christianity is a perfect man who suffered and died. And you don't need to come to church for a long time to realize that. But yet, when we suffer, when suffering comes into our lives, it is a shock to many of us. It's a shock, right? And most of the shock and pain and suffering is not about us coming to grips with the fact uh, that it's not the actual issues. We're coming to grips with the fact that we're suffering at all. That's one of the biggest problems we tend to have with it. Because for some reason, modern Western people are more traumatized by suffering in hard times than any other culture or civilization. Preach. Right? We are, we are most inclined to seek our happiness in fragile things, things that will not survive in desert places. And the life of Jesus, if it's taught us anything at all, it's that God uses suffering for his redemptive purposes. Suffering is coming. It's coming and it can be a blessing to you or it can harden you. You know, the same sun that softens wax hardens clay and it's all about what's in your heart. It's all about what kind of heart you have. 
And so the people of God begin to grumble at Moses and Moses asks them this. Listen to Moses' question. Moses is saying to them, why are you always making God defend himself? Why are you doing that? Because here's here was their complaint. Here was their complaint. Their complaint was, you brought us here to kill us. And here's what suffering people often wrestle with. Right? If you suffer, this is what you often re- wrestle with, is the Lord with us or not. This is the struggle. And so the people were accusing God of treason. You killed us. You brought us out here to kill us. We're going to die out here. And underneath all of our complaining when we suffer is this, is this subtle, subconscious suing of God. Isn't it? That many of us are, are, you know, we've been Christians long enough not to say anything out loud, right? But, but deep in our hearts, there, there's this quarrel with God and we file lawsuits with God. This is what we do. Secondly, the trial. Looking at verse four, it says, so Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what am I to do with this people? A little more and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there at the rock of Horeb. Now, the children of Israel have been treasonous with all of their grumbling, and yet they have accused God of treason. God tells Moses to take two things to the trial. He says, go ahead and take the elders and take your staff. Now, the staff was a symbol of authority. It was what God told Moses to use against Egypt in order to bring down the plagues, right? It was a symbol of God's judicial authority and power. It was a symbol of execution. The elders were the court, right? Moses only called upon the elders when they had to make a decision. And so if the court is in session, then the question is, who's on trial? Look at verse six. Verse six, God says, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. God says, I will stand before you there. Now, in ancient cultures, uh, standing before someone meant coming before a superior. That's what it meant. It, It almost always means that a servant is coming before his master, waiting for a command or a sentence or judgment. And astonishingly, in almost... Uh, unheard of fashion, God says, I will come before you. I will come before you. So there's a prisoner's dock in every courtroom and God says, I will stand in the dock. I'll stand in the dock. And so court is set. God is being accused of abandoning us in our thirst. And so the question is, what is his defense? Is there any proof that God is present in our dryness? Is there any evidence of his provision in our suffering? Is there? Let's look at the verdict. God has Moses bring the staff and elders to the rock at Horeb, and he puts them on trial in Exodus uh, 17, verse 6. And this is what he says. He says, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders in Israel. See, although uh, the children of Israel had committed treason in the wilderness, God took their punishment on himself to provide them with water, right? Now, they didn't completely understand what was going on, but we do. Because centuries later, God would physically enter into our wilderness as a man named Jesus. And Jesus was a man of sorrows. Jesus was a man who went through his own wilderness. The Bible says that he went through a wilderness for 40 days and was assaulted by Satan. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed for deliverance. He told his father, I don't want to do this. Deliver me. I don't want to do this. And from there, he was betrayed. He was taken captive. He was deserted. He was falsely accused. He was spit on. He was beat up. He was rejected, he was scourged, he was mocked, and ultimately, he was crucified. And as Jesus 
hung on the cross, dying for you and me, having remained silent all throughout his execution. Again, scourged, cross was put on his back. He had to carry it. And then he was nailed to the cross, arms stretched wide, could barely breathe, was literally dying because he couldn't breathe. He said nothing all throughout his execution except one thing. He had one physical complaint during his execution. You know what it was? I'm thirsty. And in his silence, his father, looking at his suffering son on the cross, you know what he said? This is what he said, basically. Drink your spit. The only drink you get is the cup of eternal justice. Hang on, son. Drink up. After he dies, the Roman soldiers, they come by and they pierce his side with a spear. And immediately, the Bible says, a mix of blood and water comes rushing out. This was the fulfillment of Exodus 17. Jesus, the rock, was struck. His life was poured out for us, y'all. And when water turns into blood in Scripture... You see this in the book of Exodus and you see this in the book of Revelation. When, when water turns to blood, it's always symbolizing a curse. But on the cross, Jesus reverses it and it becomes a blessing as his blood becomes living water for us. This is also a nod to the Exodus story as the people of God are again saved and rescued through blood and water. That's what it's all about, guys. Let's stand together. See, when we're in the wilderness, we often feel like we're asking God for things and he's not answering, don't we? That, that he's abandoned us, that, that, that he seems absent, he's not coming through. He's letting things happen that, that we don't understand. But Jesus in his suffering knows what it's like to not get his prayer answered. Jesus prayed a prayer and didn't get what he asked for. He said, let this cup pass from me. Deliver me from death is what he prayed. And his father answered his prayer, but not the way he wanted it. How so? Jesus was delivered by the resurrection. By the resurrection. See, Easter, the fact that a perfect sinless man can suffer and die unjustly and then rise from the grave means that if you believe in God and at his command you walk through dryness and suffering, that God will bring resurrection life. That's what it means. See, on the cross, Jesus made the payment. But Easter is confirmation that the check is cleared. Come on. Listen. Are you hearing me? At the resurrection, the crowd cheered because that means the check cleared. The resurrection means that in the end, Jesus' suffering was redemptive. And, and uh, in the end, he wasn't heard, but he really was. And if this is true, then you have to realize that God is hearing you even now, even when you think he doesn't. Because here's the best part. Here's the best part. Easter is proof of the verdict. Easter means that God was always innocent. Oh, but there's more. Because the very fact that Jesus suffered and died and was buried and rose from the grave. It does not just prove Jesus' innocence, but if you believe in him, if you trust in him, 
if you cling to him, it means you're innocent as well. And so with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, there's anyone here today who would say, Sean, I need this living water. Come on forward, you guys. Come on up. I need this living water. I've been in a wilderness. I've been accusing and suing God. I've put God on the dock, but now I realize that his presence and his provision has always been here. Let me tell you this. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. And so this is our starting point. That if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is where we start today. How, how do we do this, Sean? How do we do this? If you want this living water, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to do what the wedding guests in John chapter two did. You're going to have to admit that you're out and that you need his help. If you want this living water, you're gonna to have to do what the, the, the lady at the well, the woman at the well did, right? You're gonna to have to stop uh, looking for uh, all your water and created things and you're gonna to have to accept Jesus, the gift of God. If you want this living water, you're gonna to have to stop asking him to help you quench your own thirst like the man at the pool of Bethesda and you're gonna to have to drink from him. You're gonna to have to be like the man in John chapter nine, the man who was born blind, and you're gonna to have to ask him to give you spiritual eyes to see, even when you can't trace him, amen. And so if you're here today and you say, Sean, I wanna make this decision. I want the living water. I'm tired of living in the desert. Listen, the desert is a place where you can travel through but if you decide that you want to settle in it, it'll crush you. But God's pouring out a fountain for you today. Will you raise your hand today and receive from the Lord? Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. I see you. I see you, sister. I see you in the front, in the back, in the back. Oh, my goodness. About seven or eight hands. Is there anyone else? This is my last call. Is there anyone else? I see you, sister. Lord Jesus, I pray for your people. Lord, life is hard. There's a lot, a lot, a lot that many of us have been through. Suffering, trials, dryness, Lord, I thank you that because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, because he came and poured himself out for us, the fountain of life is open and you are here today, Lord God. Help us to drink from you. Lord, teach us how to, to build these wells within, Lord, so we can carry this water that you desire to give us so that even in the times of dryness, even as we pass through the valley of Baca, Lord, we can make it a place of spring. I thank you for that. And for everyone who raised their hand, Lord, I pray that you would visit them right where they are.